3.14159 over. Our 2007 RASC annual dinner. Um, glad to see you all here, and it's a uh, great crowd. We're going to have a great speaker tonight. So I'm going to get into some formalities. First of all, we are a Royal Astronomical Society, and for that reason, uh, we always have a uh, toast to the Queen. And I'll just, uh, before we do the toast, I'll just do a little bit of uh, trivia information. Um, you may have noticed I'm wearing a, a dark blue uniform. I did spend some time bobbing around the ocean chasing bad guys. There is a tradition with the uh, Royal Toast. Um, if you ever have the uh, privilege to uh, go to a mess dinner, a military mess dinner, during the toast to the uh, Queen, sometimes you will see some people sitting down for this. Normally we stand for it. And the, the tradition is, is that uh, the Navy is, has the privilege to be able to sit for the toast to the Queen. Now the reason for that, if you've ever toured the HMS Victory or the Constitution down in the States, you probably realize that the ceilings were very, very low, called the deckheads. And the story goes that uh, one of my um, past relatives, King Charles II, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm related to royalty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With the um, retort to the toast that he gave, he, was he stood up and he bonked his head on the deckhead. And from then on, as the uh, tradition goes, that naval personnel are allowed to sit during the toast to the Queen. So if you ever see somebody in a mess dinner sitting during the royal toast, uh, it's not a mark of dishonor. It's because we have earned the privilege. And I, on that note, uh, Mr. McCullough, the loyal toast. <coughs> Brian stands on a ship, he wouldn't hit the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> if I jumped, if I jumped, I would. Oh. If I had my glasses on, I would know who you were. Yes, 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 yes. All right. I can vouch for everything that Chuck has said because, of course, I spend some time bobbing around on the ocean keeping track of guys like him. <laughs> he had stripes. Oh, I had the stripes, yes, yes, yeah. Uh, the Royal Toast, well, the Royal Astronomical Society wasn't always a Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. It started off as a, a Toronto Astronomy Club, basically. And then uh, in 1902, uh, King Edward VII was uh, touring Canada, so the Toronto Club thought, hey, you know what, this might be a grand idea if we were to get Royal stuck to our name, and but we can make a petition to the King for that. But should we call it the Royal Astronomical Club of Toronto? No, let's go bigger than that. Ontario, let's go, you know what? We're going to do something really wild, really outlandish. The Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. The king thought that was a pretty good gig. And so the January 1903 petition was drawn up forward to the king. And on March 3rd, 1903, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada was officially incorporated. So wow. to the king, I didn't bring my glass, but you can cheer for me. And uh, to Her Majesty the Queen. Queen. Her Majesty the Queen. Her Majesty the Queen. Well, we should be sitting. We should be sitting. Let's sit. <laughs> you have the option to sit. Well, you can sit on the floor. You're good at it. So as we know, the uh, RASC, uh, we have a lot of volunteers. Basically, volunteers run the place. And uh, I have to admit, this uh, uh, being president of this organization is an easy job. Because I just ask for uh, something to be done, and bang, it's done just like that. Um, uh, Paul Harris, our Vice President, Harrison, sorry, <laughs> I knew that too, <laughs> our Vice President did all the grunt work for this, uh, this event, and uh, Paul, my personal thank you very much. <laughs> and Paul also uh, did the grunt work to get our guest speaker here. Our guest speaker happened to be in Ottawa, and uh, Paul hunted him down. And I will ask Paul at this time to introduce our guest speaker, Paul Harrison. So, uh, so I uh, I've been in uh, in touch with uh, our guest speaker uh, on and off for the last few months. So in between uh, his travels for work and. Uh, my travels around the world, but uh, I uh, realized that when I was asked to introduce him that uh, I hadn't really asked much about his background. I didn't know much other than he was a journalist and uh, he had written this book called Too Far From Home. 
So his book, is, uh, as many of you are aware, is about the astronauts who were in orbit at the time of the Columbia accident back in February 2003. Um, and I'm sure most of us here you know, remember where we were and what we were doing at the, the time of that tragedy. So uh, I uh, have a few notes about, uh, about our guest speaker. Uh, he studied uh, urban planning, but then uh, decided that writing was his passion. He uh, worked for the National Post as a sports writer and was named Canada's outstanding young journalist. His uh, experience there led him to write his first book called Falling Hard, A Rookie's Year in Boxing, which was shortlisted for the Trillium Book Award. He later joined Esquire magazine as a contributing editor and won the 2005 National Magazine Award for feature writing for the story that became the basis for Too Far From Home. Now, just uh, thanks to, uh, to chapters, I've got a, a small uh, blurb about the, the book just to introduce things. So in February 2003, American astronauts Donald Petit and Ten Kenneth Bowersox and Russian flight engineer Nikolai Budarin were on a routine 14-week mission maintaining the International Space Station. But then the space shuttle Columbia exploded far beneath them. With the launch program suspended indefinitely, these astronauts had suddenly lost their ride back to Earth. Too Far From Home chronicles the efforts of the beleaguered mission, contro uh, mission controls rather, in Houston and Moscow as they worked frantically against the clock, ultimately settling on a plan that felt at best like a long shot. Lashed to the side of the space station was a Russian-built Soyuz TMA-1 capsule, the rocket equivalent of a 1976 Remlin. Their harrowing <laughs> journey back to Earth is a power powerful reminder that space travel remains an incredibly dangerous pursuit. Too Far From Home vividly captures the dangerous realities of space travel and offers a moving portrait of people who live in zero gravity. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest, Chris Jones, as uh, he takes us on a, on a journey uh, too far from home. Hey, everybody. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank the RAS, RASC for uh, inviting me tonight, Chuck and Paul. Uh, Paul first emailed me back in May, and he said, will you be available uh, November 16th? And I said, <laughs> I have no plans at the moment. Uh, <laughs> But as it turns out, this month has been ridiculous for me, and I flew in last night, and um, I'm very happy it all worked out that I can stand here before you. Uh, the other thing I'd like to note is that normally when I give these talks, I like to consider myself the expert in the room on matters of space. Here I realize I am the dumbest person in the room <laughs> on uh, matters of space, and I understand there'll be a question and answer period afterwards. I am petrified. Uh, feel free to correct me. Any mistakes I make, uh, Chuck was nice enough to point out that I screwed up Meteor and Meteorite in my book. Um, <laughs> oh, thoughtful. Yeah, very thoughtful. That's how I was introduced the, to the, the room today. It was just Chuck and I sitting there, and I thought, I actually thought about leaving at that moment. But, uh, I stand here uh, at your mercy. Um, I did, that's just right. I did a radio show in Chicago uh, when I was doing the book tour, and um, my publisher said, oh, you know, this is a great show. There's uh, hundreds of thousands of listeners, which, of course, you want, and but also scares the crap out of you. And uh, luckily, there was someone from the planetarium there joining me. And, you know, they opened up the phone lines, and the first question was, do you think we can use ion propulsion systems to get to the moons of Jupiter? And I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of pointed to Judy going, <laughs> she ended up answering every question on that two hour program. It's like, can someone ask about astronauts pooping in space? I can answer those questions. Uh, so during the question answer, someone needs to ask me about pooping in space. Oh, sweet. Okay, so um, the story is essentially about uh, the three astronauts who were in the space station, as Paul said, when Columbia was lost. Two Americans, Ken Bowersox and Don Pettit, and a Russian named Nikolai Budarin. Now, uh, again, not being a, I was a sports writer when Columbia um, happened. I just happened to be on my couch that morning and uh, watched the disaster unfold. And every sports writer will tell you that they hate themselves because their job is watching other men play a game and then you write about the game as if it's important. And every sports writer wants to actually find a story that is important. And for whatever reason, that morning, I immediately thought of people in the space station. And 
I didn't know who was up there. I had no idea their nationalities, their names, how many of them were up there. I just knew there was somebody up there. And they must have been having some kind of day. And I called my editor that afternoon. And I said, listen, we have to do a story on these guys. And he said, that's all well and good, but you understand that they're in space and very hard to talk to. And I said, <laughs> you're probably right about that. Uh, and so we left it. And we thought, well, when they come home, maybe something will happen. And there was a little story in the Ottawa Citizen, like a four-inch story that said, Ken Bowersox, Tom Pettit, American, nearly die in the re-entry, very dramatic, blah, blah, blah. And that, that was it. I was like, nearly die. I'm intrigued. Uh, this story has become that much better. And so I said to my boss, now we must do this story. And he said, it's too good a story. Someone is going to do it before we can do it. Because to get something in Esquire magazine takes like three months. So he said, someone else will write it. So we left it alone. And no one, no one wrote it. It was one of those stories that, for whatever reason, just fell through the cracks. And again, I went back to my boss, and I said, can I do this story? And finally, he said yes. And then I called NASA up. And I said, hey, NASA, can I do this story? And they said, isn't Esquire a porno magazine? <laughs> and I said, no. Uh, so I had to convince NASA that, yeah, I read it for the articles, too. Uh, and uh, um, and uh, I convinced NASA that it is not a porno magazine in the traditional sense of a porno magazine. Uh, and they finally let me do it. And meeting these men, um, and I can say men because, as you can see from the picture, they are all men, uh, was... <laughs> For me, uh, probably the most gratifying experience I've had as a journalist. It, it allowed me to escape all those demons I had from standing, waiting for naked athletes to come out of showers and locker rooms. Uh, and I was very glad to be able to tell their story. And I'm glad to be able to tell it uh, to you tonight. One of the things that surprised me as a newbie going into the sp world of space is when I pictured astronauts, I pictured Roger Ramjet, you know, guys who are six foot six with strong jaws and biceps. and. And the truth is, astronauts are midgets. Um, they're very small, and if you saw them sitting in your restaurant, you would have no idea that they are capable of these heroic things. Uh, and as you can see from this picture, Ken Bowersox is the man in front with the, doing the two-finger salute. He's a tiny, tiny man. Um, but he is, uh, he's a, at this point, he, was, he had been in space four times previously, twice to repair the Hubble. Um, had been a Navy pilot, uh, had done 300 carrier landings. I mean, this incredibly brave, stout man uh, in, this, in this tiny, tiny form. Um, and what also intrigued me about astronauts is I thought they would be very scientific, very straight-minded. Um, but in fact, they're incredibly superstitious. And they, uh, they're, they're, they go through all these motions in order to allow themselves to do what they do. When you actually break down what they do, if you can imagine yourself strapping in the front seat of a shuttle. In that moment, I myself would be making use of the diaper that I would be wearing. Uh, and they, what they told me is that they just don't think about it. They have some magical switch where they can turn off. Because if you actually thought about the thousands, well, millions of parts in your machine and the thousands of people who worked on it, and if any of them have screwed up, that you are about to die, you would never light that switch. Uh, and here they are. I love this picture because they're boarding. That's called the Astro Van, the silver van behind them. That is taking them to the launch. And you, I, can't, I can't imagine the nerves that you were swallowing at this moment. But here you see them all smiling and happy and waving to their wives and kids. Uh, and that's, they're squished off at this point. They're not thinking about what they're about to do. So there's Ken. Uh, Don Pettit is the guy in the background waving. He's got kind of sunglasses on. Uh, and Nikolai Budarn is the man to his right, the very Russian-looking man, right over uh, Ken's fingers. Don, now, an interesting thing about this mission, going to the superstitions, um, this was mission 113, was the number of the mission. Uh, and Don Pettit was not supposed to be on this flight. There was a guy named Don Thomas, who was supposed to be the science officer on Expedition 6, which is what these three guys were known as, um, the, the sixth mission to the International Space Station. And Don Thomas, as it turns out, in his previous space missions had taken on too much radiation. And NASA has this arbitrary red line where if you've got this much radiation, you can no longer fly into space. And during training for this mission, Don Thomas blipped over this red line. And they broke the news to him, you can't go. And Don Pettit uh, suddenly got the call. And Don Pettit is a rookie. Now, the switch out, a crew switch out, there had never been a crew switch out since Gary Sinise was replaced by Kevin Bacon <laughs> in Apollo 13. <laughs> and of course, Apollo 13, STS-113, they're kind of going, oh, this is kind of freaky. Then the pilot for the mission got switched out. So two switch outs, and it was Gus Loria threw his back out in his shower, replaced by Paul Lockhart. 
So they've had two switch outs. A rocket, a Soyuz test in Russia exploded as they're waiting for this. The launch previous to this was Atlantis. Uh, some of the bolts that tie the space shuttle to the launch pad before it didn't explode. They're supposed to explode. They didn't explode. Uh, there was all these kind of bad omens. As they get in the van, they're all admittedly kind of tense, even though they're trying to switch off. And they decide to play a joke on Don Pettit, the rookie. So they get in the van. They're driving to the launch pad. You can see the shuttle out your window, lit up by spotlights. Nerves, nerves, nerves. There's security helicopters flying above you, guys with machine guns sitting on the decks, uh, you know, because this is after 2000 or September 11th. Um, and a security guard waves down the van and boards and says, I need your security passes. And six of the astronauts pull out their security passes. <laughs> and Don Pettit is going, I don't have a security pass. And the other guys turn around and look at him. They're like, we've gone through all this. We've gone through all this. And now you don't have your pass? And he's just sitting there going, guy, I don't, I've never even heard of this security pass. I don't have this pass. And they're like, rookie, ruining everything, blah, 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 blah. And finally, Ken Barasox breaks a smile. Jim Weatherby, who's the commander on the far right there, breaks a smile. And Don slides into the space under his seat. <laughs> they go to the shuttle. They board the shuttle. They strap themselves in. The countdown begins. And there's an oxygen leak. They find oxygen in the space behind the cockpit shouldn't be there, it's called off. As they're fixing the oxygen leak, someone bumps into the Canadarm, our, our, our delightful invention, uh, and bruises it. And the mission is scrubbed. You can't go. Go back to Houston. So I, I don't know if you can imagine that kind of adrenaline rush and then collapse. And these guys are talking about how bitterly disappointed they are, especially Don Pettit, the rookie, about to get in space, finally. And they don't let him go. So they go back, finally a couple weeks later, they get to, they load them back in, load them back in. There's a storm in Spain, which you might think doesn't matter at all, except that's where one of the emergency landing sites for the shuttle is. Everybody back off the shuttle. So the second time they're back off the shuttle. And as they're doing this, the wives and the children are on the, where they're watching. I mean, there's this tremendous exertion of energy every time they're loaded in. Finally, in November of 2002, they finally get to launch. Nighttime launch. And this has taken, uh, one of the interesting things I found out, I don't know anything about machines or space, as I've told you. Uh, so I focused on the people. And one of the things, since uh, the Challenger disaster, the families watch from an isolated rooftop. They take them away because in Challenger, they were photographed you know, in their grief. Uh, and they talk about all being bundled together on this rooftop, the wives and the kids and the parents, uh, and watching that. And how they, Mickey Pettit, Don Pettit's wife, who's this tremendous person, talked about how the switch that the astronauts make, the wives make too, or the husbands make as well. And at this moment, she said she went from being afraid to suddenly in awe. If, I don't, how many people here have seen a shuttle launch in live? I mean, it is, you have to make the trip. It is incredible. And the noise, the feeling, it's like an earthquake. Um, and I, I tried to put myself in the position of Mickey, say, watching her husband as she's holding her twin two-year-olds take off on that big pile of gasoline. And here's how fragile this machine is. Someone asked me earlier tonight, would I ever go? There's no way in hell I would get on this thing. <laughs> that machine is so fragile that there are little plastic owls that you can buy at a hardware store, those decoys so that pigeons don't land on your roof. They have those around there because a woodpecker once put a hole in the fuel tank. And my thinking is that here's this machine, this billions and billions of dollars in this massive technology that can be taken down by a woodpecker. <laughs> no. <laughs> and this, of course, is their destination, the space station. Now, I'm going to get this backwards because I always do. But at the time when these guys went up there, when Expedition 6 went up, there were only three modules. The, the station was in the middle of, and is still in the middle of being constructed. Two Russian modules, uh, Zarya and Zvezda, and uh, the American lab called Destiny. And they were all kind of in a train, as you can see. And in this particular picture, there's a Soyuz capsule at the bottom of the train. There's several places for the Russian Soyuz to dock. Um, now, what surprised me, if, I don't know if you've been in, there's, in Houston, there's a mock-up of the space shuttle. And you can get in the cockpit. And it is this very claustrophobic space. In fact, if you're taking a dump in the toilet, your legs are sticking out the curtain. Like, you can't close a door. You're, you're, you're taking it there with your friends. Um, and so when they got to Space Station, Don and Ken and Nikolai talked about how big it was, how it felt like this enormous space. Uh, it's 150 feet long at this point, about eight feet wide inside. And they talked about it being a mansion, that this was palatial to them. 
and how excited they were to be there, but also how nervous they were. Don kept saying, and by the way, 50% of astronauts get sick when they go up, and Don was barfing his brains out. And so they finally get to the space station, Don is sick, and he's petrified they're going to send him back. You're too sick, you can't do this. Uh, or that some emergency is going to uh, prevent them from completing their mission, or that uh, there'll be some ch magical change of plans whereby they can't go into the space station. So until Endeavour docked, put them on, took Expedition 5 off, and until the hatch was shut and Endeavour was drifting away, Don didn't quite let go that this was his home. Uh, but once Endeavour left, these three guys did their best to make this sterile, under construction, highly mechanical, very loud, surprisingly loud place, uh, and very stinky. No shower on board. These people are up there for weeks and months. Um, home. They tried to settle in. And here they are uh, on their very first day. Don at the bottom, Nikolai and Ken. And the very first thing they do is they try on the Russian spacesuits. These are the Russian the cosmonaut suits. Because if there is an emergency, their way of escape is the Soyuz that is lashed to the side of the space station like a lifeboat. And they have to make sure that their suits fit and that they can get in the Soyuz in case something happens the instant they get there. So here they are. This is their uh, very first moment on space station, trying on the Russian suits. You can see how short their hair is, and you can watch in the slides progress as their hair starts ballooning. Um, I guess I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the three guys. Don is my favorite guy because Don was new to space. And so for me, I could ask him every dumb question about being new to space, and he would answer them very patiently. Uh, he's a scientist. And Mickey Pettit, I always felt bad with it because she did not sign up to be an astronaut's wife. Uh, Don was a scientist who looked at things like clouds. He worked at the National Laboratory in Los Alamos. He had tried three times to get into NASA and was always rejected. Never knew why he was rejected. I mean, it's very hard to get in. But, uh, and then his fourth time, he finally got in. And now he's finally in space. Um, and for him, it was like his most perfect laboratory. He had this giant place in space, zero gravity, all these nifty machines, all these materials. He was a kid in a candy store. Ken Bowersox, the guy on the top right there, uh, military guy, as I was, I was talking about. And there's always been this divide at NASA between the military guys and the science guys. Uh, you know, it's like the jocks and the geeks in the high school cafeteria. There's this great place. I'd, like to, I'd love to write a book just on a day in the life of the astronaut office at NASA. It's on the sixth floor of this building in Houston with cubicles. You know, it's like Dilbert, but on steroids. Like, there's just <laughs> macho guys walking around, the military guys, who all talk like Chuck Yeager. They can be from Chicago, but they talk with this crazy southern accent. And then there's the science guys all off in their corners, you know, looking at their little things. And, 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 uh, and they don't really communicate. And Ken and Don, the Americans don't do any kind of crew matching in terms of personality or will you guys get along. And because Don was a last minute substitute, they didn't really know each other at all. But what bound them at the beginning was their desire, deep desire, to go to the International Space Station for an extended mission. You know, Ken talked about shuttle missions being just enough of a taste to really addict you. And each time he went up the four times, it got worse. It didn't get better. He always thought, well, if I'll go one more time, maybe this will cure me. And it never did. He wanted to go back, back, back. So he's also very excited to be here. Nikolai, the guy on the left, who I always called the crazy uncle from Russia, doesn't speak English. So he's in for a lonely time. <laughs> but it had been to Mir twice. So he is sort of the expert on a long duration space mission. And even though they couldn't really communicate with each other, which still boggles my mind, um, the Americans would watch Nikolai work. They'd watch him operate. And they picked up so many things from him about how to live in space. Uh, for example, Nikolai would always take out his dessert, his dinner dessert, and put water in it and stick it on the table and let it sit all day. And these guys wondered why he always did that. And, and finally, he just showed that, like he did it to their food, and it tasted so much better. Uh, something in the water brought out the flavor of the food. And these are the little tidbits that Nikolai sort of passed on to them as time went on. This is their giant space, uh, which to me looks like you're locked in the trunk of a car. <laughs> Completely uncomfortable. This is Ken. Um, one of the things I liked about Ken, very honest guy, that pair of blue shorts, he wore those blue shorts every day he was up there. Uh, and one of the great mysteries of space, you know, what's at the bottom of a black hole and how do you get clean laundry in space, which is very difficult. And no one had figured this out. Ken figured it out. He, he, he got Ziploc bags and he squirted some water in and got some soap and he did this and he rinsed and he rinsed and he dried and 
clean shorts. So he wore these shorts every day he was up there. And here's Don. One of the great things about Don is he's Mr. Fix-It. They've talked about the mission to Mars, and everyone in Houston is saying Don has to go on this mission because he can fix anything. This scares the people in Mission Control who don't like people to touch anything up there. <laughs> Don here is working illicitly on, on a, a microgravity box, uh, you know, this machine that was up for the previous mission, Expedition 5. They broke it within a day of being up there. And Don was sort of looking at this thing going, I can fix this. Mission Control is saying, Don, do not touch that. <laughs> and Don is saying, no, no, I think I can do this. I think I can do this. No, Don, do not touch the machine. So Don turns out the radio, turns off the radio and blocks the cameras. And this is Don working on the microgravity glove box, which in fact he fixed. Um, another one of the great stories about Don is when he was new at NASA. Um, again, if you can imagine how weird it is sitting in a classroom of astronauts, uh, very smart, dedicated people, heavily experienced, and they're talking about rocket propellants. And Don, when he worked at the lab in Los Alamos, occasionally might take some piece of equipment from the lab and put it in his garage at home. And eventually, he, his garage became a massive science lab. And he actually tapped into the electrical systems, first of Hu uh, at Los Alamos and then of Houston, so he could use these machines. And occasionally, once in Los Alamos, well, there's a, block, a blackout, uh, because of Don Pettit and his garage. <laughs> this is a secret. Um, so anyway, Don was in his garage in Houston and decided for fun he would uh, mix up some liquid oxygen, which is a rocket propellant. Uh, and he made a bowl of it. Uh, he had a bowl of liquid oxygen sitting in his garage. And the professor or the teacher in their class is talking about liquid oxygen. And Don raises his hand and says, oh, do you know what color liquid oxygen is? And the teacher says, no. Like, it's always in vials or canister. I mean, it's not something you just... And Don says, no, it's, it's blue. I've got some in my garage. I made it. <laughs> and everyone in the classroom kind of turned around. <laughs> and Don's sort of, I just thought you'd want to know. And, uh, <laughs> and that secured Don's reputation at, at NASA. I mean, even at NASA, he is an exceptional person. Exceptional is such a nice word because it can mean anything, right? It's like interest. Oh, that's interesting. And here's Nikolai. Um, very happy not speaking English. Uh, <laughs> And this is, this is the most palatial part of the space station. This is Zvezda, which is one of the Russian modules. So it's really the heart of it. Um, and it's relatively clutter-free in this picture. They, they cleaned it up. Uh, but behind each of those panels, of course, is like incredible machinery, uh, things that turn oxygen out of, I don't know, wine. Uh, <laughs> they can do all sorts of crazy things. And, um, and Nikolai, this is Nikolai's home. This is what Nikolai does. He, he handles all of this stuff. What's interesting for me, one of the interesting things was because uh, it's under construction, the space station's under construction, there was no habitation module yet. Uh, for whatever reason, they decided to leave that one. So there's no place to sleep, there's no shower, there's no real kitchen, there's a little kitchen in this, in this module. So Nikolai and Ken were sleeping in these little uh, sleeping booths, about the size of a phone booth, uh, in this module, and Don bunked up in Destiny in the American lab, you know, with a sleeping bag on the wall. And Ken hated sleeping in this part of the space station because it's very loud. But he didn't want to cause a diplomatic incident by saying, I don't want to sleep in the Russian segment. So he slept there for about a month. And then there's a little thing called the node, uh, which connects the American modules to the Russian modules. And it's quiet. It's got water, bottles of water, it's essentially water storage. And they used to make fun of it because some wacky interior designer at NASA decided to paint the inside of it coral. It's like a kind of pink. Uh, and the astronauts were like, yeah, I make the pink module, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they love it in there. And Ken ended up rolling up a sleeping bag, floating down to the node, strapping it against the water, and that was where he slept for the rest of the mission. Um, mindfully said of Don Thomas and his radiation problems, because water absorbs radiation. And that's what, that was his reasoning, but I think it was because it was pink. <laughs> Everything is great for Expedition 6. They really, really were having the time of their lives. Um, it was a 14-week mission. For them, it went quickly. It went all too quickly. Uh, if you can imagine, an astronaut you know, works their whole life towards the time they're in space. It's the way archaeologists spend all that time in libraries for those rare moments when they're actually out in the field digging. Um, they, spend every, you know, they dedicate everything to getting up there. And, uh, and, and the other weird thing about them as they got, as they're spending time up there is they kind of drift away. As you might imagine, like, 
Don and Ken especially started talking about, they communicated with the ground less and less. They sort of got into their own routines. Uh, they liked how their days unfolded the way they wanted them to. They're never caught in traffic. Uh, you know, they're never asked to cut the grass. Uh, they're never interrupted by rain. Um, you know, they had this strange kind of perfect life until February 1st of 2003. Now, in the backs of their minds, they knew Columbia was returning to Earth that day. Uh, Columbia didn't dock with the space station. They were up in orbit together, but they never met. Um, but Don especially had several classmates among the crew. And Don was very good friends with Willie McCool, who's the guy at front right. And Willie and Don were playing an ongoing chess match. Don being Don, the crazy technical inventor whiz, had invented a chess set for space, which he has a patent for now, um, made mostly of Velcro. And they would email moves to each other or talk radio moves to each other. And the last communication between Columbia and the space station was Willie saying E2 to E4. Don was in his little sleeping compartment. He makes the move. He uh, thinks about his move. He drifts off to sleep. He wakes up the next day, Saturday, February 1st. Saturday's a very lazy day on the space station. Uh, you just kind of putter around. You do some maintenance. You might do a little science. Um, and in the backs of their heads, they knew Columbia was returning. And the radio crackles. And as someone from Houston saying, guys, we need, we need you to stand by. And that's not unusual. That happens fairly frequently that Houston will call up. Uh, so they're kind of floating around, and they're not really paying any attention. And then a guy named Jefferson Howell, who's the head of the Johnson Space Center, came on the line. And he said, guys, I've got some bad news. And because it was him delivering the news, they knew what his next words were, which were, we've lost the vehicle. Now, they're 250 miles away from Earth. And as I was talking about that drift away from the realities of Earth, they were in some ways buffered from the realities of Columbia. The space shuttle has these, and this will sound terrible, but they're ridiculous safety measures. Uh, there's something called the pole, for instance, where if the space shuttle becomes disabled as it's returning to Earth, traveling 17,000 miles an hour, this pole, like a fireman's pole, will come out the side, and these guys are supposed to ride this pole just to get past the wing so they can parachute to safety. That will never happen in a million years, but this pole exists. Don and Ken start thinking, maybe the pole worked. Maybe our friends are coming down to Earth under parachutes. Uh, maybe they're safe. Maybe they're in the hills of Texas somewhere having a campfire. Uh, they just couldn't get their heads around the fact that these guys might be gone. And it wasn't until Mickey Pettit, Don's wife, uh, NASA came to her door and she'd seen the pictures, right? She saw the pictures that we all saw of Columbia breaking up, the astronaut's helmet on the grass, uh, you know, the reports of um, finding remains, or there was a golf course where a piece of the engine block tore a new water hazard uh, into the sixth fairway. Golfers started complimenting the superintendent on the water hazard, and he's going, I don't know what you mean. Um, Mickey <coughs> saw all this. Don couldn't see all this. Mickey asked to talk to Don and called him up and said, uh, Don, uh, you know, you've, you've lost your friends. And he was saying, no, no, we're, we're confident that, that, you know, something worked, the safety procedures worked. And, and Mickey, not to be mean, she just needed Don to get to where she was. She said, no, Don, you have to, you have to understand, they're gone, they're gone, the shuttle is gone. Um, and it wasn't until that moment that they actually realized the, the gravity of the situation and that these seven people were lost. Uh, Don went back to his sleeping cabin and the first thing he sees is the unfinished chess game with Willie McCool and he rolls up the chessboard and it was the first time he had cried in space and for me when Don this took a, I mean months and months of interviews before Don admitted to crying in space so, you know this is this is not something that astronauts do um, and for me it, it's, it's such a purely natural thing to do I mean you're you've, you're alone and you've lost your friends and he said he wasn't it, until that moment he realized that with your tears they won't fall down your cheeks because there's no gravity so he was had these pools of water around his eyes, they would knock away, and then his tears would be floating around him in this space, in this uh, sleeping compartment. And he just, as he was describing this moment to me, that's when I realized like how powerful the story was. You know, the idea of these tears floating around this guy in space. Um, and for me, that's become Columbia. Whenever I think of Columbia, I think of Don and his tears in space. Uh, like the flakes in a snow globe is how he described it. Um, it was incredible, really. And and this this story. Again, it was just passed over. It was one of those stories that just disappeared. Iraq was happening. Elizabeth Smart, you know, a pretty blonde girl, disappears in Utah, and that takes up the front pages. Uh, SARS was happening. And this story just, just got lost. 
Another interesting character in this story is Sean O'Keefe, who is the head of NASA at this time. Uh, he's, uh, this is the memorial service. He's the man with the mustache in the center of the screen. Like me, he knew nothing about space when he entered this world. He was a budget slasher. His reputation was a bureaucrat that cut budgets. His last act before he came to NASA was to deny NASA funding for the space station. Then President Bush appoints him the head of NASA. As you can imagine, very uncomfortable for him to arrive there. <laughs> walking down, he's talking about walking down the hallways and people kind of looking at him and you know, giving him the finger behind his back. And, and it wasn't until Columbia that he kind of found his footing because he didn't know anything about space, all he knew about was money, he didn't know anything about machines, but he knew people. Uh, and in his years, uh, in his other jobs, he had, he, he had always been good with people. Uh, and the interesting thing about him, even though he's a bureaucrat, he's from Louisiana, he's an Irish guy from Louisiana, swears like you wouldn't believe for a bureaucrat. Uh, and he was the first, and this amazed me too, the first NASA official, uh, administrator, to talk to the guys in the space station while they're in space. He called them from their kitchen on Christmas, from his kitchen on Christmas, um, and he became, becomes sort of the central character. He's, he, he, he is, uh, in, in, in some ways, he's like the civilian view of all this world because he didn't know it. He, he was feeling his way as I was feeling my way through it too. The three astronauts in space went to their own corners for a long time after Columbia. Um, the ground gave them time off. There was a stark realization after they you know, were finished with the grieving process. They knew from Challenger that their ride wasn't coming anytime soon. And the ground was saying, no, no, we're going to fly another shuttle. Everything will be on schedule. But they knew that NASA was lying. They knew that Challenger grounded the fleet for two years and that something similar would happen. They listened to that memorial service from the previous slide. They rang. There's a ship's bell up there. Uh, chuckle like this. The space station has tremendous amounts of naval tradition. Um, they treat it like a, a, a galleon uh, on the seas. There's a ship's bell up there. They rang it seven times for seven astronauts. And then they decided, we're up here for a long time. We're on our own. Let's make do with what we've got. And Don, uh, this is Don shortly after the accident. This, this window is in destiny. It's the best window on the space station. Perfect glass. And he spent days looking out this window back at Earth, thinking about his wife, thinking about his children who turned two while he was up there, and taking pictures. And he ended up taking 25,000 pictures, all told, from, a, from this window, mostly post-Columbia. Because the other thing that happened was uh, space missions are highly regimented. They're, they're, they're timed almost to the minute. Um, well, all of a sudden, these guys have a lot of extra time. And Ken decided he would take over most of the by-the-book science and let Don take pictures and do sort of fun science. Uh, and that's how they decided to get through. And NASA called up again and finally admitted, you're going to be up there for a while. Uh, it might be two years. And these are guys, remember, with wives and children and lives on Earth. Ken has three kids. Um, Don has two kids. Nikola has a couple of kids. Uh, and although they were having such fun in space, you know, all of a sudden they started realizing the things they missed about Earth. Uh, eating, for example, all of a sudden things like oranges, you know, fresh fruit. A uh, steak off a barbecue, a shower, uh, sleeping flat with your head on a pillow. Uh, all these things that we take for granted, they started really sort of thinking about. Um, and I think when Don was sort of looking down on Earth, he would sort of think of all these things that he was missing. His particular, his favorite time to look at Earth was at night. Um, in the daytime, cities just look like smudges. Uh, and apparently it's very hard looking out a window to, to know what you're looking at, what part of the world, unless you see a coastline, it's very hard to know what you're looking at um, until night. And then you can make out things like coastlines and river bends and airports and stadiums. This is Los Angeles at night. The mountains to the north are dark. Disneyland is the, or Dis is it Disneyland? Disneyland or Disney World is the bright light to the right. Um, and Don would look out these windows and make, take all these pictures. And he's working on a picture book now, actually, called Cities at Night. He took thousands of pictures of cities at night. Uh, one of the interesting things, I was uh, talking to Chris about this, actually. The space station's rotating around, the, you know, flying around the Earth, and Don would try to do this to take a clear picture. He'd try to go in the opposite direction. Well, of course, he can't move his shoulders 17,000 miles an hour. Um, so Don being Don, he took an old IMAX camera mount, a drill, a couple of bolts, attached it to his camera, pressed the trigger of the drill, and it would allow him to take crystal clear pictures of Earth, because it, at that point, he'd figured out the rotation. That's the kind of ingenuity that these guys have. And Don also sort of lost himself in what he calls Saturday morning science, just playing. 
uh, using his imagination. And this is a picture. This is a thin film of water uh, in a wire loop, and he's doing this to it. And it's swinging back and forth. And he took, he would take ordinary things like sugar or food coloring. Uh, he'd stick a soldering gun, a hot soldering gun into something like that to see what would happen. He'd stick, he'd make a giant sphere of water and put an Alka-Seltzer in it. What happens to Alka-Seltzer? Well, of course, it bubbles and fizzes. And, and if you spin, spin the sphere, then it, you know, it's like a, a centrifuge. Um, and all this, by the way, is all videotape. You can find it on the web. Everything NASA has is public use. Luckily, because NASA didn't cooperate with the book. Uh, so I could pirate everything. Um, and Don really lost himself in this stuff. The other moment they lost themselves was when they got a call from NASA saying, oh, by the way, space station is falling apart. <laughs> so, <laughs> just to make life interesting, because they're bored at this point. Um, and something that, talking about the, the, the shuttle with the woodpeckers, the space station, there's billions and billions of dollars. Um, there's radiators outside of it to vent heat from the solar panels. And over the joints are these things they call booties, just little thermal protectors. Uh, there's a 400 degree swing in temperature and the sun and the shade and these things keep the radiators from exploding. Well, they started coming off. They just, for whatever reason, the booties failed. They get the call, you've got to go outside and fix the booties. Uh, it was going to be Ken and Nikolai. Nikolai had done several spacewalks. And then just to make things more interesting, they found out that Nikolai had developed a heart murmur uh, and wouldn't be able to go outside. So Don, the rookie, once again thrust onto the first team. Uh, has to do a spacewalk. And for me, this, this was the most sort of mind-boggling part of it. I couldn't imagine the idea of opening a hatch and seeing pitch blackness, because when they open the hatch, it happened to be, they happened to be passing through night. It was perfect blackness, and then saying, I'm going to go out there. I'm going to step outside. Some nut at NASA has figured out that they have a 1 in 496 chance of being hit by something. Those are your odds. Uh, and if you get hit by something, obviously you will either die instantly if it happens to be a big thing, or you'll have a very bad eight seconds if it happens to hit you in the arm, you know, when your eyeballs start popping out of your head. And the other fear, of course, is that if you're cut loose. And they've actually done, well, what, what happens if you're cut loose? You float until your air runs out, and then you die like drowning. It's called hypoxia. Uh, and they've actually talked about how dreamy it would be <laughs> to be the astronaut who's dying in space. They know all this. They, they study this, they're, they're taught this, and yet they open the door and go. And that again is that switch that I don't have. I don't have the, I can turn my terror switch off. I'm scared, I'm scared. Um, but these guys aren't. And what Don will tell you is that we make choices, every day we make choices. If we decide to go to a movie tonight, we're taking a risk. We, we might get in a car accident. But we decide the joy of watching Fred Claus is worth the risk of going outside. It's not, by the way. Um, <laughs> he's just taking that to a different scale, right? He's saying, this risk is worth the rewards I'm getting. And one of the moments he described is when they went outside at night, 16 dawns and dusks a day they'll, they'll fly through, every 45 minutes, day, night, day, night, day, night. And when it's night, it's really night. And when they were outside to fix the booties, it became night, and NASA said, just hunker down for 45 minutes. So Don crawls to the front of the space station, again, 17,000 miles an hour, crawls to the front of the space station, hunkers down, turns off the lights, turns off the light on his helmet, and just looks at the stars. And I was talking to someone before, um, I'm not sure what the polite term would be. For some of you, I imagine, that would be the equivalent of a very happy moment. <laughs> I'm trying to think of what the word is. I know what the word is. Um, and Don was talking about riding the front of this space station and looking up at starlight that is red and yellow and green. And I went, red? Don, you're on crap. Starlight's white. And it's not in space. It's red and yellow and green. I was like, that's incredible. Stars don't twinkle. You know, the planets are brighter. Everything is brighter. Um, and he talked about this 45-minute ride on the front of the space station. And he said, that is my reward. That is why I do this. That is, you know, that is why I'm up here. And that's why I sacrifice everything I've sacrificed. Uh, and then, in that moment, I kind of understood it. I wouldn't go up there, but I understood it. <laughs> they fixed the booties with copper wire, believe it or not. Wrap copper wire around the booties. And that is what is holding the space station together as we speak. <laughs> the Russians, by the way, are magical at this stuff. 
Because of Mir, Mir suffered 1,500 mechanical failures. Fires, all sorts of garbage went up, on up, there, up there. And the Russians are great at fixing stuff on the fly. It petrifies the Americans, because the Americans like to study, right? The Americans want to analyze. The Russians are like, no, no, fix. <laughs> if you go to Russia's mission control soup in Moscow, there are cats roaming the, the aisle because there are mice, thus cats. <laughs> to Russians, this makes perfect sense. Right? <laughs> Problem fixed. It's like the, the probably apocryphal story about the pen and the pencil, right? The zero gravity pen. Russians brought pencils. Going, what the hell are you doing with the pen? Um, and that's, that's how they're working now. And the copper wire, Nikolai is inside going, copper wire. Booty, wire, tie. And Ken's going, what are you talking about? Ken, copper wire, tie, good. <laughs> this is Don falling out of the hatch. Um, Ken, brave Ken, brave astronaut Ken, said this was the one moment where he went, gulp. He said he looked down between his feet, and he saw his feet, and he saw the earth, and he saw 250 miles between, and he went, holy shit. <laughs> and then he switched that off and went, out, went to work. The other funny thing that they did while they were out there is um, during a previous installation, this light, this light was stuck in its light. Everything's battened down when it gets shipped up to space, and they couldn't figure it out. So suddenly emboldened by the copper wires, Don scoots over to a tool bag. There's a tool bag outside the space station. Opens it up, and there's, for me, this, is, this, this describes the two space programs to a T. There's the American hammer, which is a little, like a watchmaker's hammer. And there's the Russian hammer, which is an eight-pound sledge with a saw in it. So Don takes this sledge, and he scoots on over to this light, and he says to the ground, I'm going to hit this light with my sledge. And the ground says, Don, do not do that. Don says, no, I shall do this. And the ground says, if you do that, wait a long time before you hit it again. So Don wails on this thing. And of course, I'm going, well, I must have made a massive clang. And he's like, I'm in space, you dumbass. There's no sound. <laughs> uh, and he wails and he wails and he wails, and the light is free. Now, of course, it's all bent and dented to hell. But Don Pettit loves this. And he thinks that in 10 years, astronauts are going to be outside. They're going to look at that light and go, crap, we have been hit by a bunch of shit. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll be Don's little hammer. <laughs> and Don taking pictures. Uh, this is shortly before his ride at the front of the machine. So, yeah, that's, he's sitting on the front of the hall. It's like that Titanic scene, you know, that terrible scene, I'm the king of the world, times a million, without James Cameron messing it up. There we go. And while they're outside, they could look at their Soyuz. Foreshadowing. Uh, this is the Russian way of traveling to space. And as we talked about hammers and so on, the Soyuz is the biggest piece of crap you've ever seen in your life to look at it. There's one, you can go inside one at Houston, and it is like crawling into a little bucket. It is three seats, the, com the controls are here, everything is plastic and cyrillic, you have to put your knees to your chest to make room for yourself. Don is five foot eight, and he's as tall as you can be inside of the Soyuz. Uh, there are American astronauts, there's one guy who's six foot, and he's called too tall. He's too tall, he can't go. <laughs> too tall, cannot go into space with the Soyuz. Um, and it, but this is what the Russians have used for, well, when the Americans were going to the moon, the Russians were flying this thing. My Soyuz tail, the way I explain to lay people uh, what kind of machine the Soyuz is, underneath the seat in a Soyuz is a double-barreled sawed-off shotgun. And I love when NASA talks about there's no weapons in space. And I don't, I don't know if you remember when a certain astronaut went a little kooky and put on a diaper and drove to Florida to kill someone's wife or something. Um, and they talked about, well, if that happened in space, it wouldn't be a problem, she couldn't do anything. There's a gun in this, uh, in this thing. And Ken, being military Ken, when he first got there, uh, he found the gun and found the bullets and decided that if Don or Nikolai went cuckoo, he was going to use the gun. I swear to God. So uh, there's a double barrel sawed off shotgun under the seat in the Soyuz. And that is because in the 60s, one landed off course. The guys opened the hatch, and there were wolves. And they were attacked by wolves. And they decided ever since then, every cosmonaut and now astronaut needs to pack a little something under the seat. That is the Soyuz. <laughs> By the way, the Russians get very pissed off when the Americans talk about how crappy the Soyuz is, especially after Columbia, because the Russians say, you've lost 14 astronauts in two accidents. 
the Soyuz has had accidents. Uh, the very first Soyuz crew died, all three of them, or uh, Salyut crew, the first crew to come back from the space station, Russian space station. Um, but it doesn't have nearly the catastrophe total of the shuttle. They get a call. These guys get a call. The problem with the Soyuz is it lasts six months in space. Once it's been up there six months, it starts falling apart. And that Soyuz had been up there five and a half months. And NASA is sitting down on the ground going, we're not going to get the shuttles back up flying anytime soon. Food and water was becoming a concern. Nikolai's heart murmur, adding to the drama, we got to bring these guys home. They get their Beth math, geek, math geeks on the case. Can we send a crew up? Yes, we can send a crew up. There can only be two of them, and they must be very light eaters. And that's what they decided to do. They're going to replace Expedition 6 with Expedition 7, fly them up on the Russian system, bring these guys home on the Soyuz. Again, they put on their Russian suits. Some lovely, uh, those guys in the background, Russian heroes of space. I'm sure you guys would know their names. I do not. They all look like Santa to me. <laughs> and Expedition 7 arrives safely. The Soyuz launch. Ed Liu, front left. Yuri Malenchenko, front right. Um, they, they rocket them up to space. Everyone from America goes to Moscow to watch this happen. Sean O'Keefe, the mustachioed head of NASA, very relieved when Expedition 7 arrives. Expedition 6, they switch places. And Expedition 6 goes home on the Soyuz. They were excited. They were disappointed to leave, uh, but they were excited. Uh, Cam especially was excited to be flying a new ship. He'd flown the shuttle. He'd flown, as a test pilot, several naval ships. Suddenly, he's the first American to return home on a foreign vessel, along with Don. And the first Americans to return home on a capsule since 1975. Uh, the Americans, understandably, fairly nervous about this. What made them even more nervous is this particular Soyuz, the TMA-1, is the first of a new model. The Americans begged the Russians to update the computer system so it didn't look like a Commodore PET. Uh, and they fixed them up, but in true Russian tradition, they never flight tested it. They sent it up and thought, it'll work. The three guys are loaded in. And this will also explain Don. Very small in there, they could take home three things. When they went up, they were big duffel bags of stuff they could take up. Coming home, three things, no more, no less. Don had used chopsticks up there all the time. Um, he'd squeeze out his drinks so a sphere of tea would be in the air and he'd pinch them and eat them. He'd eat honey with his chopsticks. He used these chopsticks for everything. He has to take these chopsticks back with him. So he's telling me this story and he's going through this and then he said, and then I had this necklace. I had Mickey's favorite necklace. And whenever I was lonely, I would run it through my fingers, and I'd be like, oh, that's great. And he said, so I left that up there. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the answer. And instead, he took two spoons. The Russians had spoons, long-handled spoons so you could scoop out of the bottom of pouches. Don loved these spoons. Don, as an engineer, thought, these are perfect. This is a perfect solution to a problem. I'm going to take one of these spoons, each for, one each for my boys. We're going to sit around the campfire years from now. We're going to use these spoons to eat the food out of the tins, and it'll be very happy. Mickey, very sad. Boys, very happy. So they've got their stuff. Ken took his shorts, by the way. Um, <laughs> and everything's going normally at this point. One and a half rotations around the Earth in their tiny little capsule, eating salt, drinking water to prepare themselves for reentry. Nikolai is the commander of the mission at this point. Um, and there's audio of this, and it is fantastic, because Don doesn't know what the hell is going on, because Don speaks English and is the engineer who has never flown before. You can hear him going, what's happening? What's happening? And Nikolai's answering in Russian, and Don's going, I don't know what's happening. And it's, the audio is great. I got it by paying a guy at the Russian embassy. I'm being totally truthful about that. Everything's, this is their view as they're leaving, uh, saying goodbye to their, their home. Um, Mixed feelings, sad that they're leaving, happy that they're going to see their families again. Um, but again, that switch, turn it off, we're going home now. One and a half times around the Earth. The great thing about the Soyuz, as a metaphor, is that it's completely automated. It's controlled not by the ground and not by the guys inside. It's controlled by the machine. Totalitarianism at its best. Um, and as they're, they're sort of watching the displays, watching the displays, everything seems fine. And these little rockets fire to slow it down enough so that it enters the Earth's atmosphere. And these all work. They enter the Earth's atmosphere. Plasma, fire, all sorts of things burning out the window. Very pretty. It's interesting to listen to it again, the audio. You hear Don saying, that's a lot of fire. And all of a sudden, Nikolai goes, yeah, that's a lot of fire. And he's kind of question, there's a question mark at the end of it. 
And then they see the Soyuz is actually three little capsules, and the two two are jettisoned once they re-enter the atmosphere. And Don and Ken, who are on the outsides, look out their portholes and see these capsules jettisoned. They're like, wow, that's really cool. The problem is they shouldn't be able to see it. There's something wrong because they can see these. And all of a sudden the machine announces, we're going into ballistic descent. And you hear Don say, what is ballistic descent? <laughs> and Ken, in his typical American military, Don, we're in for a fairly aggressive re-entry. <laughs> That's exactly what he said. In other words, this is going to hurt like a mother. So, uh, ballistic descent, normally the Soyuz, fairly gradual return to Earth, blah, blah, blah. Ballistic descent, they've been loaded into the shotgun that is under their seat, straight down at the Earth. And that is because one of those rockets fired a quarter second too late. That was enough to mess up their attitude, see the capsules jettison, they're screwed. G's start to build, fire outside. One G, two G, three G's, four G's, five G's, six G's. The audio again, Nikolai is counting. And you can hear them sort of grunting. They start grunting and wheezing. And Don's tongue starts going down his throat. And Ken feels his ribs separating. Uh, they're just pressed, press, press. Seven G's, this is hurting. Eight G's, this is really, really hurting. And all I can hope for is that the Earth's atmosphere slows them down soon. Because that's what they're relying on now. No brakes, Earth's atmosphere. Resistance from the atmosphere. And eventually it does slow down enough, and they make it through. Then, of course, the problem is the parachute, which uh, is again automated. And Ken is sitting there wishing there was this giant red button that he could punch to open up this goddamn parachute. This is what he's thinking. And they sit, and they sit, and they sit, and finally the parachute opens. Everything is fine. They land. That's good. Wind picks the, captures the parachute, they start tumbling across the ground. Nikolai cuts loose the parachute, they're on their side. Don, Ken is on the bottom of this pile, and there's this great, again, the audio. Don, or Don has been holding uh, some books on his lap, and he says, and he sounds very sick when he says it, he says, Ken, I'm about to lose the package. And Ken says, that's okay, just do it in a bag. And Ken, you hear Don kind of going, well, I don't, I'm not following, and Ken's like, I don't want you to throw up on me. And no, no, I'm talking about the package. I'm literally talking about the package. But she passes on to Ken, and everything's happy again. <laughs> and Ken is looking out the window. He's looking out the window that's pressed against grass. And again, when we talk about the tears, uh, Don's tears in space, Ken looking at this grass is another one of those moments for me. They hadn't seen colors like that in a long time. Uh, they hadn't seen life like that in a long time. And he just stared at this grass. He said it was the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen, was this grass. Um, now they're waiting for rescue. People are there to meet the Soyuz. Except, because it's automated, and because the Soyuz sucks, no one in Russia knows that they've landed off course. No one in Russia knows that ballistic descent has happened. So everyone in Russia is where the Soyuz is supposed to be, and they don't show up. <laughs> and they start looking at the sky, looking for a parachute. They're going, where? And back at Mission Control, where the wives and the children and Sean O'Keefe is sitting, the radio goes dead. There's a crackle, and it's dead. 16 minutes before they landed. 16 minutes was when Columbia disappeared. 16 minutes before Columbia disappeared, that's when they disappeared. That's when their radios went dead. All of a sudden, the radios are dead again. Sean O'Keefe decides that NASA will be closed. Sean O'Keefe actually went through the process of back-to-back -back fatal accidents. NASA's done. We will not fly again. Mickey is crying in a kitchen. Annie Bowersox, Ken's wife, is trying to comfort her. Nikolai's wife is not there because it's Russian superstition. The wives never show up because otherwise they will not meet their husbands again. And here they are with the Americans going, why didn't we listen to Russian superstition? Why did we show up crying in the kitchen? And they're gone. Meanwhile, back on the steps of Kazakhstan, as it turns out, Don, Nikolai, and Ken in their capsule going, where is everybody? I want to get out. <laughs> Ken's saying to Nikolai, I want to get out. Nikolai's saying, no, no, they'll be here any minute. Hours pass. Ken's like, I'm getting out of this goddamn box. Nikolai says, yes, it's time to get out of the box. <laughs> and by the way, when it turned on the side, the radio antenna drove into the earth, and that's why no one knew where they were through that way. Finally, they find another beacon. They fire it up. A jet happens to hear it. Five and a half hours, they were missing. And then they finally hear the beacon. Jet sees them. They wave up. Um, and for me, uh, the end of the story is when the helicopters come over the horizon. And I said to Ken and Don, I said, wow, that must have been quite a moment when you hear the helicopters. You finally know it's over. And they said they were both devastated by that moment, that it was noisy. All of a sudden, it's very loud. All of a sudden, they're about to see people. Handshakes feel like crushes. Hugs feel like crushes. Um, they're going to miss being alone. They're going to miss 
not being rained on. And instead of thinking of all the things they missed about Earth, they started thinking about all the things they missed from here. And immediately, as they're lying there and the helicopters are coming, they set their minds on how they're going to get back. They start thinking about how to return. And that's the pull that space has on these guys. It's incredible to me that they go even once. Ken has been up five times. He's now retired. He'll never go back. Nikolai, retired, will never go back. Don is going back in September. Uh, Mickey, not very happy. <laughs> Don, ecstatic. And that's how he, I mean, for me, that says it all. That, 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 that home, as a writer, you know, it's like a cheap metaphor, but home changes for these guys. No longer is it earth. No longer is it gravity and ceilings and coffee out of cups. It becomes this place. And, uh, and I will never go there. <laughs> I'll take questions as long as the first one is about pooping and peeing in space. <laughs> About pooping? So how many days were they up there? 160 days. Um, a little under six months. And the mission was originally 14 weeks. So as it turns out, it was extended, but not dramatically. The record is something like 369 days. Um, one of the interesting things I discovered was a guy named Sergei Krikalev, a Russian cosmonaut, who is the Forrest Gump of cosmonauts. He shows up everywhere. The first time a Russian flew in a space shuttle, Sergei Krikalev. On Mir, when the coup happened, uh, Sergei got stranded up in Mir, and he's watching Russia explode. He was the last, there's a documentary, I think, called The Last Soviet. Um, and he, 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 he left the Soviet Union, he came down to Russia. He got handed a Coke when he came down. He's like, what the hell is this? <laughs> the first crew on the space station, Sergei Krikalev. Uh, he went back up there a few months ago. I mean, this guy is everywhere. So uh, he has the record for most times in space and longest duration, but yeah, 160. The American record, I think, is 196 days. And they did poop every day. Pooping? It's interesting you ask about that. <laughs> so, um, so first, peeing. Uh, I couldn't put this in the book, although, but I, I make sure I tell this story everywhere I go. And please forgive me. Remember, I'm a sports writer and a meathead, and I find these things funny. So, when men would pee in space before, they would put on a condom with a hose attached to it going to a bag. And NASA would come up to each guy and say, what size condom do you need? And every guy would say, I need the biggest condom <laughs> you have. I am a giant. I need this. And every astronaut, except for the legitimately huge ones, peed all over themselves. <laughs> NASA decided this is, this is not good. This is not good. So they made a template, a cardboard template with holes cut in it. <laughs> and every guy, every guy had to take the template in the bathroom and kind of go, but of course, every guy said, I am huge. I am the big circle. I am this circle. And everyone peed all over themselves. So NASA takes the template, and they change the labels. Because the original template was labeled small, medium, large. You know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Who's going to come out? What astronaut going to I need the small. No one's going to do that. So they rename it. Small becomes large. The next one becomes huge. The next massive Zeus, you know, like <laughs> Godzilla at the end. Everyone's Godzilla. Everyone pees all over themselves. So they finally decide this is not working, We're gonna, and they develop a vacuum, a hose. They switch the hose, you kind of sidle up to the hose, and you pee into the hose. And Don says, every rookie does this, you get a little absent-minded, and you become too intimate with the hose. <laughs> and you finally end up with that giant penis that you wanted. <laughs> a different color than it was when you went up. <laughs> Well, NASA is. Um, Speak to the lady with the British accent there. Or? I did actually. Is there only one lady with a British accent at NASA? Are we talking? Okay. Um, uh, crazy British lady at NASA is what I called it. Uh, NASA was good and bad. For the magazine article, after I convinced them that Esquire wasn't a porno mag, they let me in. However, being Canadian, they didn't let me all the way in. There were many places I couldn't go. And I was saying at dinner actually, one of the greatest days of my life was sitting at the security booth at the front of the Johnson Space Center. Um, I was there for about four hours doing all the bureaucratic nonsense that they make you do. There was a steady stream of uh, what I uh, lovably call the, the tinfoil hat set coming in saying, I own NASA, give me NASA, or you have planted something in my teeth, I need it removed, or um, I saw a spacecraft in my living room. And there was, honestly, probably 20 people came into this place in the four hours I was there. And there's a very nice lady behind the counter going, oh, that's very interesting. You have the deed of NASA. You've written it out on your bus ride from Kansas City. That's great. And meanwhile, she's hitting this button. 
<laughs> right at the counter. And out of nowhere, these like giant men would appear and drag these people off. And I don't know what ever happened to them. Um, so that's NASA in a nutshell. Uh, so they were cooperative with the magazine article. Unfortunately, when I went to do the book, a book called Dragonfly um, about Mir came out. And that guy was actually given an office in NASA. Like he was let in, way in. And then he bit them on the ass and wrote a really nasty book. And they decided they didn't want anything to do with books. And so NASA said, you, you, you cannot have access to anything. Now, fortunately, all the film and audio and photographs are public record. So I had all those. And fortunately, Don and Ken disobeyed NASA and talked to me. Um, the one place I never got access to is Russia. NASA called Russia. I asked for a journalist visa. I never got it. Uh, so I never got to Russia. But, um, so NASA was good and bad. Good at the start, very, very bad at the end. And I think they're terrible at marketing. You know, they really need some work on, uh, because this is a story of heroism. It's, a, it's the kind of story that might actually get people interested in space and space travel again. And they didn't want to cooperate. They didn't trust me enough, you know, to let me go for it. Even though I'd written a story already that they all loved. It was a very strange experience for me. And hugely frustrating. Um, and it wasn't, I'd written 40,000 words of the book, and I got a call from NASA at 11.30 at night saying, uh, we're not going to help you. And I really thought at the bottom it dropped out of it. And 40,000 words is a lot, and I was very sad. But then Don called about five minutes later saying, I will help you. So it all worked out. <laughs> yeah? Any idea if uh, Russians carry up vodka with them? <laughs> yeah, I talked to someone, Eric, where's Eric? I, uh, b b yeah, beforehand. Um, so on Mir, they had vodka, and they also smoked cigarettes, which I found interesting. Um, and that is because Mir came to smell very much like Dirty Bum, because there was antifreeze leaks, and a t-shirt lasted you two weeks, and no shower. And so they started smoking, not, I think, for the nicotine rush, but for a change of whiff, essentially. Um, now, the Americans are like, you can't smoke in the space station, and you can't drink in the space station. And again, I didn't put this in the book, because Don asked me not to, but Don, being Don, magical inventor type. Don's garage, in addition to a science lab, is also an incredible brewery. Um, <laughs> kegs and kegs and kettles and delicious. So Don made hooch in space. Um, <laughs> there was a point on one of the hashes where it was ice cold. Uh, for, I, don't, I don't know how you make liquor, but for, the cold was good. Um, and he made hooch. And they, and they drank the hooch. And they did not die. <laughs> and they enjoyed the hooch. <laughs> so they have no real booze up there, but they make it. <laughs> yeah? Um, I was given your book as a present by my lovely wife. And, and Are you going to break up with her now? No, no, no. <laughs> I love her even more. Ah, <laughs> but, good answer. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks. And, um, There's a bud coming, by the way. Yeah, no, it, it was a really uh, refreshing way that you told the story. It was very different from the other many books I've read on the same <laughs> subjects. Um, does it taste like more? Sorry? Are you going to do another one? Are you oh. Gonna, are there any other stories to tell? I think there are many stories to tell. Uh, I'm about to do a story on Steve Fawcett, uh, who I found, I found it very interesting that in this day and age someone can disappear. Um, uh, I'm probably going to, I'm hoping to do a sequel when Don goes back up, uh, and hopefully doesn't have quite the same drama. Um, I have become a space guy, um, which is strange for me because I, was not at all, uh, but now I actually pay attention. And, um, well, and as I'm sure most of you feel, uh, I, I now wish other people paid attention. I feel like I have to be on this campaign, like this is, this is incredible. Every time a shuttle takes off, it's a miracle. Uh, and unfortunately, space seems to have become very routine for a lot of people, that it's, it's almost boring. Um, I think that's partly because NASA sucks at marketing. I think it's partly because the experiments they do seem really arcane, like looking at fruit flies or protein production or crystal growth, and you're like, what the hell does that have to do with anything? Um, but if you really get into the stories, again, and particularly about the people, like you get into the family drama. Um, here's a little story I forgot to tell. Uh, the, 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 the homes, you know the story, the, 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 if you actually did read the book. Uh, the, the wives or husbands get video conference units in their living rooms. And once a week, they're allowed to talk to their partner in space. And they're told this is a private channel. This is their conversation. So Dawn is up on the space station, and Mickey is down in the living room. And it's 7 in the morning. And she's got her cup of coffee and her bathrobe on. And the kids are asleep. And Dawn says, you know, uh, Mickey, I'm kind of lonely up here. And Mickey, they start talking kind of naughty. And, uh, and all of a sudden, Mickey goes and gives Dawn a little show. And 30 seconds later, there's a knock at her door. And there's a car parked on her lawn. And a kid going, 
Ma'am, don't do that again. <laughs> so Mickey's boobs were four stories high at the front of the Johnson's, you know, on the big screen. <laughs> Those are the stories that I like. So I actually, I actually did. I do still want to do something on the people at home. I, I got into it in the book as much as I could for the space in the book, but I still think there's something great to be written on astronaut families. Like, um, and actually, the book uh, has thankfully been sold for movie rights, and they're writing. And I, I hope they spend a lot of time on the families. Like, I, I think for me, that's half, half the story. Another. Little detail, um, Ken's kids were older than Don. I mean, Don's turned two while I was up there and never quite understood what was going on. Ken's kids, the youngest was six and knew better. And you can actually, I'm telling you this, but I'm sure you know, you can see the space station as it flies overhead, this little white light, yeah. Um, and they would track it on their computer and they would time it and they would run outside. And if the timing was right, they would see this white light come over the trees and their daddy, right, in this light. And Luke, the six-year-old, uh, would take off running after it thinking that he could cover enough of the curve of the earth to catch a little more of that. And of course the light would always disappear and Luke would be heartbroken. Um, but for me, those moments, like the idea of kids chasing the space station so they can see their dad, I, I don't understand how that is not compelling enough for people to be interested in it. Uh, and those are the stories that NASA needs to tell, I think. It's a very convoluted answer to your question. But it did allow me to talk about Mickey Pettit's boobies. <laughs> which are spectacular. <laughs> How long did it take you to write the book or the story? Um, the story was quick. The story I wrote on the plane ride home from Houston, um, like 8,000 words just barfed out of me. Um, when you're a writer, you get moments. Uh, I call them cha-ching moments, like when you're talking to a guy and a little cash register goes off in your head. Um, and Don would talk, say about his tears, or Ken talking about his kids running on the street, and I would be like cha-ching, cha-ching. And there were so many cha-chings, and it just came out. Um, the book probably took me two years, I would say. 